Today's American Academy of Ophthalmology presentation is titled Iris Registry, Improving Performance and Outcomes in Ophthalmology, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our content moderator, Ronaldo Wanzo, who will introduce the program and today's featured speakers. Ronaldo, welcome to the program. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar about the American Academy of Ophthalmology's Iris Registry, the first comprehensive eye disease clinical registry. I'm Ronaldo Juanso, the Academy's Vice President for Marketing and Communications, and I'll be your content moderator for the call. Today's webinar will provide an overview of the IRIS Registry and its benefits to ophthalmologists and their practices. We will cover how the registry works and the measures that compose the registry. Toward the end of the webinar, we will provide 15 minutes for a question and answer session. If you would like to submit a question, please type it into the question box on your screen. And as previously indicated, this webinar will be recorded and archived on the IRIS Registry website at www.aao.org slash IRIS Registry. We're fortunate to have with us today two speakers who have been instrumental in the development and implementation of the IRIS Registry. Dr. William Rich is the chair of the Registry Measure Development Work Group and serves as the Academy's Medical Director of Health Policy. He served on the Academy's Committee of Secretaries as the Secretary for Federal Affairs and has played an active role in a number of other Academy activities since the 1970s. Dr. Rich currently practices as a senior partner in Northern Virginia Ophthalmology Associates and serves as chair of the Health Professionals Council of the National Quality Forum. He has also served on several Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and Institute of Medicine panels dealing with the future of fee-for-service Medicare and economic incentives for promoting quality. He served from 2003 to 2009 as the chair of the American Medical Association Resource-Based Relative Value Scale Committee. Also joining us today is Dr. Michael Chang, who is the Knowles Professor of Ophthalmology and Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Chang's research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and by several charitable foundations since 2003. He is the chair of the Academy's Medical Information Technology Committee and is a member of the Academy's Pediatric Strabismus Annual Meeting Program Committee. He serves on the editorial boards for the Journal of the American Association for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus and the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association and regularly serves as a reviewer for many other academic journals and research organizations. He's received numerous clinical research and teaching awards. Before I turn it over to our presenters, I would like to briefly go through the agenda for today's webinar, which will provide an introduction to the IRIS registry. We'll talk a bit about the big idea behind the registry, which is really the convergence of the notion of big data, medical registries, and how the academy will put that to use to drive better outcomes for patients in the future. We'll discuss a bit about the value of the IRIS registry to ophthalmologists and their practices. We'll talk a bit about measures, what they are and how they can help you. We'll talk a bit about specifically how the IRIS registry works. We'll cover how you can participate and then we will dedicate a considerable portion of our time today to answer questions that you might have on the IRIS registry. So to get started, I'll provide a brief introduction to the IRIS registry. The IRIS registry, which stands for Intelligent Research and Sight, is the nation's first comprehensive eye disease clinical registry. It enables ophthalmologists across the country to use clinical data to improve care delivery and patient outcomes. It will help ophthalmology practices to meet the requirements of the federal physician quality reporting system, meaningful use, and the value-based modifier, thus streamlining 
the way to quality-based payment. The IRIS registry uses scientifically valid and HIPAA-compliant methods to collect data from patient records directly from electronic health record systems. Essentially, the IRIS registry will be a watershed moment in really shortening the timeline for the dissemination of important clinical knowledge, research, and results and to really help to drive quality improvement for the profession of ophthalmology going forward. With that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Rich. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a quote from our AVP, David Park. Uh, it's really, and I believe this firmly, the IRS registry will represent a seminal change in how the medical specialty of ophthalmology will improve performance outcomes, and most importantly, shortening the timeline for the dissemination of important clinical knowledge, research, drug advice, surveillance. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Let's talk initially about the big idea, measuring and improvement. Lord Kelvin in 1880 said, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And that's become uh, the basis of improvement in industry, in um, sales and marketing, and especially exemplified by Dr. Deming, who took this concept of measurement and turned around the Japanese economy uh, after it was at the end of World War II. His quote, when people and organizations focus primarily on quality, quality tends to increase and costs fall over time. When people and organizations focus primarily on costs, costs tend to rise and quality declines over time. What is the big idea? First of all, let's look at what a medical registry is. I personally hate the name. It makes me think of uh, felons and uh, wedding registries, but it's the, it's the word we have to deal with. And, the and it's an organized system that uses observational study methods to collect uniform data, clinical and other, to evaluate specified outcomes for a population defined by a particular disease, condition, exposure, and that serves one or more predetermined scientific, clinical, and policy issues. Now we get that out of the way. Let's actually uh, define what it means for us as a profession. Here's our mission to develop a registry of ophthalmic ambulatory encounters, which captures essential delicate elements for continuous quality improvement, maintenance of certification, enhanced patient care outcomes, and paper performance programs. It will be easy to use, timely, and responsive to the needs of the profession. And we also anticipate post-market surveillance and health service research in the future. What are the principles? As a practicing ophthalmologist, it's key to myself and my partners. We as individual ophthalmologists own our own data. Protections are in place for the discovery of doc-specific data. And participants, we the physicians, have to give information for our data to be distributed or reported. The academy owns the aggregated data and reports and benchmarks, and there's data protection and security in place including patient protection, everything is super compliant. And this is key, the burden of data entry is minimized. Ophthalmologists are the most efficient and productive uh, practitioners, and we, this will not be successful if, if it dramatically affects the way we practice. Why are we doing this now? EHR adoption is 32%. The recent uh, survey says maybe up to 40% and growing. And several recent studies have resulted in insufficient evidence for clear recommendations. Frankly, we need better science. Here are, it's February 19, 2013. Someone in the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force had a bad hair day. Uh, insufficient evidence to assess the balance of benefits and harm of screening for primary open angle glaucoma in adults. Most importantly, look at the second bullet. Medical and surgical treatments for glaucoma lower intraocular pressure, reduce the risk for optic nerve damage over the short to medium term. But 
And this is the key point. Which treatments best prevent visual disability and improve patient outcomes is unclear. We need better studies. This is the consensus. The big idea of big data. Here's a definition of big data, and then I'll get into some of the practical implications of it. Big data are high volume, high velocity, or high variety information assets that require new forms of processing to enable enhanced decision making, insight discovery, and process optimization. Um, big data is defined. Here's Laszlo Bach, Senior Vice President of Google. One of the applications of big data is giving people a fact and getting them to understand that their own decision-making is not perfect, and that in itself causes them to change behavior. Uh, so if this has revolutionized production and retail, how is it going to affect medicine? The power of aggregated data can't be underestimated. We're going to see a rapid evolution of new types of scientific inquiry to include elements of correlation in addition to causation. That's the power of big data. Aggregated, aggregated data allows researchers to identify correlations related to outcomes and then develop predictive risk assessment models and questions for further inquiry. What comes to mind is the floppy iris syndrome. It took a billion data chance several years to figure out the correlation. It would be nice for us to press a button, look at all the drop nuclei, find out they're mostly male, found out, find out they're mostly on full nets. That's the power of big data. Um, at this point, what's unique about the IRIS registry? It's an outpatient registry with the ability to follow patients longitudinally using probabilistic matching. That's what Google used to identify you when you're walking down the street by going by your favorite pizza place. We do not have a national patient identifier. So this is a real software break for them. It's given us the ability to find someone if they moved from my practice in Northern Virginia to see Michael in Oregon. Um, other surgical resident registries that have been around, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the American College of Cardiology, record the short-term evaluation of drugs, devices, and procedures, but are unable to measure their impact on the natural course of the disease. Iris will. And big data will facilitate the common drug and device surveillance, and the Irish Registry can serve as a background for mandated FDA studies. At this point, I'm going to ask Mike to talk a little bit about the value of the registry. Mike? Well, Bill, thanks. Um, in probably the next five, ten minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, benefits of the Irish Registry, number one, to the profession of ophthalmology. Uh, number two, to participants, in other words, individual ophthalmologists, and also number three, to patients. And so as far as benefits to the profession uh, of ophthalmology, um, the, the number one, uh, the number one uh, benefit here that we've got on this slide is providing drug and device surveillance, um, you know, uh, uh, addressing disparities in care and outcomes. Uh, in other words, we've got good versus bad outcomes, and um, you know we all know that there are differences um, based on, for example, one drug versus another drug, you know, one surgical technique versus another surgical technique, uh, or even one physician versus another physician. And the point here is basically exactly like um, Dr. Rich said earlier: uh, having that data is really the best way to drive continuous quality improvement. And so the point here is, uh, you know, improving quality, you know, not really penalizing people for poor, um, you know, for poor performance. Uh, so really, this is a mechanism to speed the learning about the effects, uh, the benefits, and harms of different treatments. And the point here is that we've got the capacity to perform things like real-time monitoring and assessment, so based on that whole big data uh, principle. And uh, the last bullet point here on this slide is um, demonstrating the value of our services as ophthalmologists. Um, uh, on this slide, we've got a couple other um, benefits to the profession of ophthalmology. And uh, number one here is uh, providing an infrastructure for subspecialty registries. Um, you know, we know that there's a lot of interest within subspecialty groups about developing registries for really very specialized uh, purposes. Uh, things like cataract surgery, glaucoma devices and drugs, uh, AMD treatments, diabetic retinopathy, corneal grafts, uh, and so on. 
And one thing that we've learned from this entire process is that um, it takes an enormous amount of effort to build this type of infrastructure uh, to manage this data. And so it's our hope that AAO can put in um, a lot of that effort and that um, uh, this may be a collaborative um, uh, uh, opportunity with subspecialty organizations to develop these um, more specialized registries that can piggyback on that infrastructure. Okay, so a lot of potential in this area. And uh, the U.S. government and industry are really moving in the direction of registries. And so we're really comfortable that this is, the, um, you know, uh, this is where the future is headed, okay, big data and uh, uh, registries. Uh, we thought this was an interesting quote. Uh, you, must, you must be the change that you wish to see in the world. And um, uh, I think this is a point that Dr. Richard alluded to earlier, that um, in a lot of ways this is a unique time in history where people have always been interested in quality improvement. Uh, but I think in a lot of ways, this is the first time that we've really had enough, enough um, technological power and um, uh, access to that sort of big data that we can collect and mine it uh, on a large scale. Uh, and so from that respect, this is an um, um, uh, amazing opportunity that we have now to really improve our profession and the way that you know, we practice ophthalmology. Um, at this point, we'll start talking about the benefits to um, individual participating ophthalmologists. Uh, so the number one point on this slide basically ties into what we'd said before, that this registry, um, IRIS registry, gives an opportunity to improve performance uh, by allowing ophthalmologists to mine their own data to ensure quality of care. Okay, so um, uh, the vision here uh, is that we've got um, uh, individual ophthalmologists and their colleagues, uh, all of whom are dedicated to improving performance uh, uh, with the overall goal of enhancing the quality of patient care and outcomes. Okay, so what the registry will really provide is an opportunity for providing real-time reports uh, to allow individual ophthalmologists to know not only um, uh, how am I doing with my practice, uh, but how does that compare um, uh, with benchmarks uh, based on other practices, other spe subspecialties, regions, or um, you know, the population, the U.S. population as a whole. And um, uh, this next bullet point here is about risk adjustment calculations. Uh, one of the challenges um, uh, of registries is that um, you know, you know, some patients are more difficult than others and some populations are more difficult than others. And um, uh, the challenge here is to provide risk adjustment to be able to identify um, you know, what makes a challenging patient. And so one of the principles in developing this registry is that we wanted to provide the infrastructure to perform those risk adjustment calculations to account for patient care comorbidities and differences in severity of illness. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And um, uh, going on to this um, uh, next slide, uh, benefits to participating ophthalmologists uh, really allowing you to manage patients at a population level. Okay, so moving from individual patients to populations. Uh, so the point here is that uh, you can look at specific groups of patients uh, based on various conditions, risk factors, demographics, or outcomes, and see you know, how are my patients doing as a whole. Uh, you know, and going beyond that, how are my patients doing compared to other patients from other practices in my region or across the country? Okay, so the benefits of this, um, uh, opportunities to identify trends, to track interventions, and to answer specific clinical questions uh, that are relevant to you know, your own patient population. Now, um, the IRIS registry uh, builds in certain tools um, you know, like HQuery and Pop Health, uh, and what those tools really allow you to do is the exact things on this slide. Okay, how are my patients doing as a whole, and how are they doing compared to other patients you know, across the country? And as we were... Um, developing this registry, um, you know, people, um, uh, people in the work group had the question, well, do individual EHRs allow you to do this already, you know, to review um, uh, your patients? And in some ways they do, um, but in case any people in the audience have questions about this, um, uh, yes, some EHRs do allow you to do these things, uh, but you need to do a lot of work with the vendors uh, to develop those functionalities. And the point here is that IRS registry uh, can help do that uh, for you. Now, um, uh, the other thing is that there's obviously no EHR that allows you to compare your patient population uh, to others across the country, and that's another unique uh, benefit of the IRIS registry. And, um, you know, the last thing in terms of how population management is different in IRIS registry compared to um, uh, within the EHR 
is that the um, uh, IRIS registry focuses on specific conditions and patient data and only on those um, uh, patients who meet the registry criteria. Uh, and so um, from that perspective, the report time is a lot faster than if you were to manually go in and do this uh, within the EHR. And the point is that um, uh, uh, it should not slow down or impact um, you know, your data collection or workflow okay, in the way that if you were to pull those reports individually from your own EHR, uh, that it would. Okay, so that's, um, uh, you know, summarizes benefits um, to participating ophthalmologists. And at this point, uh, Bill, let me, let me turn this um, back to you and to go through some of the financial incentives about IRIS registry. Exactly. Thank you very much, Mike. Society has determined that uh, there's much more quality improvement being made in the registry rather than simple EHR. But if you look at some of the incentives and payments that the registry can assist you with, um, you can act, the biggest part is the bonuses have mainly passed, but it will enable you to avoid the onslaught of penalties occurring in the near future. It will also enable you, as you look in the second bullet, if you have a complete EHR-based system and necessary modules to meet stage, U, stage two, uh, the registry can do your quality reporting. Uh, the IRIS registry is expected to meet all the government criteria to submit your PQRS data, and it's expected to meet government certification to submit your quality measures. But what does this mean? If you look at this slide, it shows you the alphabet soup of looming penalties. Dr. Kruger, who is the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors for President Obama, has that is Nobel Prize by showing human behavior change more in the response to small penalties rather than winning the lottery. And if you look at this, as far as you can see, you are faced with onerous small cuts that add up to a lot of money. After 2017, you're looking at somewhere between 5 to 7% ongoing cuts that the base is reset to the previous year's cut. This is non-sustainable if you're in practice. The, what the registry will enable you to do is to do your quality reporting, to qualify for your value-based modifier, your EHR meaningful use quality reporting, and your PQRS. So at $5.8 billion a year, if you take 5 to 7%, that's a lot of money. And for each individual ophthalmologist with a modest Medicare income of about revenue of 300 million dollars, that's about $21,000 a year. So society has decided that not only do you think this register will improve quality, but they're going to financially reward physicians for participation. Um, the benefits to the individuals is also maintenance of certification. The American Board of Ophthalmology has participated in and supports the creation of the Academy's Registry Development Work Group and the creation of the IRIS Registry. The IRIS Registry is envisioned to support ABO's maintenance of certification part four performance improvement modules by automating the collection of data directly from EHRs. This will reduce or eliminate for manual data input by ABO diplomats or their staff, therefore greatly facilitating quality improvement efforts, health assessment, and improved care delivery. Will also enable you to keep up with the changes in regulations and requirements. The Academy will update the registry as needed and submit the data required to meet new and evolving criteria with no extra work on your part. And at this time, uh, the benefits to patients, uh, let's review that. Patients who are treated by participating ophthalmologists will benefit from the experience of their own clinician whose knowledge is augmented by data-driven by thousands of clinicians and millions of patients across the country. In the long term, the data collector will support new discoveries and need to improve patient care. Um, Mike, why don't you review what measures are, how they're going to be used in the registry? Bill, thanks. Thanks. Um, you know, I think that one of the the things that's interesting about this topic is that we're really talking about uh, improving individual patient care uh, through the feedback that um, Bill and I have talked about. 
uh, and then you've got that continuous quality improvement, and that improvement percolates up uh, toward public health and large-scale improvement toward the profession. And that, from that perspective, this is really a you know different and almost um, you know revolutionary way to think about you know how we as ophthalmologists take care of our patients uh, individually and also as a uh, society. And um, uh, measures are one really critical aspect um, of that. And so what we'll talk about here is um, uh, you know, how we develop those measures and really what they are. And uh, we thought this was an interesting quote. Um, uh, tell me how I will be measured, and I'll tell you how I will, how I will behave. And uh, uh, for me, when I first heard this, it had a little bit of a, a big brother connotation to it. But um, as I reflected more about it, it's something that's really um, true throughout life that you've got kids who take exams in school, you know, people who are getting into medical school, you know, athletes who are wanting to play professional football and running their 40-yard dash. And, and really, um, uh, th I think this is how people behave. And um, uh, the challenge is uh, how do we identify useful outcome measures that are clinically relevant uh, to individual practices and also to um, uh, the profession as a whole. And so th th that's what we'll go into here. Uh, so measures... Uh, what are they, and why do we have them? Um, so the goal here is that um, uh, continuously measuring and reporting these outcomes uh, helps to ensure that our healthcare system can deliver better care, uh, meaning effective, safe, efficient, uh, patient-centered, equitable, and timely. Okay, and here's another quote from Dr. Park. Uh, we didn't become physicians to be average. Uh, we can't truly know how our performance stacks up against our objectives unless we measure that performance and analyze it quantitatively. Okay, so more data. Um, in this slide, the first, um, uh, the first point of this is that um, uh, outcome measures are intended to be risk-adjusted metrics. Okay, and they're a means to provide the track of quality of healthcare services that we're providing. Okay, and uh, you know, the second bullet point here is something that we thought was um, important that the ophthalmic measures um, that we're building for the IRIS registry are defined and they're developed by the profession. In other words, by ophthalmologists, uh, not by the government. And um, you know, having said that, uh, number one, if we don't do them, you know, somebody else will do them for us. And number two, it's our hope that if we develop um, uh, good measures for this, that eventually they can be um, uh, used by the government for reporting purposes. And so again, just to reiterate some of the things that you know, we've talked about before, uh, the measures use a wide variety of data uh, that are associated with a doctor's ability to provide high-quality health care. Uh, so just want to spend a couple minutes talking about um, uh, how this measure development process uh, has really been working. Uh, in 2012, the Academy conveyed uh, a clinical data registry uh, measure development work group. And um, that work group consists of people who are felt to be um, subspecialty leaders uh, and also key informatics experts from across the country. Uh, so different uh, uh, people from different subspecialty groups. And uh, right now, uh, there are individual outcome measures uh, for cataract, for glaucoma, and for AMD. Okay, so in other words, uh, these exist uh, right now that have been developed uh, by the work group. Now, other um, measures that are under development now uh, involve amblyopia, uh, strabismus, cornea, and also oculoplastics. And so what's going to happen with this um, measure development work group through the academy uh, is that uh, we will continue uh, to develop more subspecialty measures, uh, and the goal is that the vast majority of academy members uh, are going to have meaningful performance measures uh, relating to their subspecialty. And so the goal is that um, uh, there should be measures for all the subspecialties uh, by 2015. And so um, just to uh, uh, reiterate something that Dr. Richard alluded to before, uh, this is done by an academy um, uh, uh, work group, uh, but it's also done in collaboration with the American Board of Ophthalmology. And so there are some ABO folks who are working very closely uh, with this work group. Um, now, what specifically do these um, uh, measures entail? Well, number one, they'll include um, uh, typical clinical uh, outcome measures. Uh, for example, after cataract surgery, uh, visual outcomes, refractive errors, uh, things like that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, so you've got your standard, uh, for example, visual acuity. Um, but some of the other data that are collected uh, for the IRIS registry 
are going to include things like uh, complications, you know, other adverse events, and also patient satisfaction, basically um, uh, patient reported outcomes, uh, as well as visual function uh, that's related to activities of daily living. Okay, so the idea is that it's not just um, uh, clinical outcomes, but it's outcomes that are meant to reflect a holistic uh, patient experience. Uh, uh, so how can um, individual ophthalmologists apply measures uh, within their own practices? Uh, well, just to um, rehash this point, um, uh, using data from the IRIS registry would enable individual practices to analyze their processes and procedures, uh, and that may become a basis for things like fact-based decision-making. Okay, we talked about this concept uh, under the next bullet point, uh, that the registry captures data in real time. Okay, so from that perspective, uh, it can help practices efficiently manage patient care uh, and demonstrate effect, uh, appropriate use of resources. And um, uh, lastly, there are monthly uh, feedback reports that come directly from the um, uh, registry vendor. Okay, and what those feedback reports do is um, uh, uh, summarize what's been happening um, uh, during that month within the practice, and they allow the practice to monitor and improve performance continuously. And again, uh, benchmark their performance uh, against other practices or against a national uh, a benchmark. Okay, so um, in this set of slides uh, coming up, uh, what we want to do is talk about, you know, really how does the IRIS registry work from a more um, uh, technical or um, uh, operational standpoint. So let me, um, let, let me go back here, specifically uh, number one, data entry, number two, EHR integration, and number three, reporting. So with regard to data entry, uh, there are two ways to enter your data. Um, uh, number one is integrating with your electronic health record system. And so that's a more automatic, uh, that's a more automated procedure. So automatic uploads based on what you're putting into your EHR. Okay, and number two is an online portal with manual uh, data entry. So we see a couple questions uh, popping up here about what happens um, if you don't have an EHR. Uh, so this is the answer to that, that you can either do it um, automatically through the EHR uh, or there's an online portal uh, with manual entry if you don't have an EHR. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Uh, so as far as that first uh, option, uh, EHR integration with automatic uploads, uh, the, way that the, the way that this works is that uh, the vendor that the academy has contracted with uh, it's called uh, FIGMD, so F-I-G-M-D. And uh, uh, they've had a really rich set of experience uh, working with uh, EHR integration. Okay, so um, you know, there's a large, um, uh, there's a large uh, set of registries within the cardi uh, cardiology community through the American College of Cardiology, and FIGMD has worked with them. And so they've got a lot of experience uh, working with individual EHR vendors and getting data from those systems. Okay, and so um, uh, with that background, uh, the principle of FIGMD's um, approach to this is a so-called system integration solution. And um, uh, what that does is that it's designed to integrate with your EHR and allow individual ophthalmologists to perform, uh, to participate within the IRIS registry um, uh, with really minimal um, workflow modification or interference. So in other words, uh, the principle is that you should be able to do what you would normally do and the FIGMD systems integration solution will extract that data um, uh, from the EHR. Uh, so the systems integration solution is meant to work with any EHR. Uh, the vendor, and we'll talk about this in the slides coming up, uh, will work with your IT group. Um, and um, so in principle, it shouldn't matter what version of the EHR or how much customization uh, you've done to the EHR. Uh, but what that means is that uh, your IT staff has to talk with the FIGMD vendors um, about exactly what customizations, what customizations you've done and how you do things in your practice. Okay, so that, that, that's how those pieces fit together. Um, uh, the way that this systems integration uh, solution works with your EHR is that um, uh, the system integrator for the IRIS registry involves um, installing a piece of software that's called the lightweight connector. Okay, so that's a FIGMD term uh, for that software. And it's installed on the server that stores the data uh, for your practice. Okay, so what that piece of software, the so-called systems integrator lightweight connector, um, does is that it helps um, 
uh, interface with the EHR and extract the data elements that are required for reporting to the IRIS registry. Uh, so in other words, we've defined, uh, we're, we're working to define what data elements are going to be necessary to build up these outcome measures and the systems integrator uh, software here extracts those pieces from your EHR based on how your um, uh, IT staff you know, coordinates that with the FIGMD technical staff. Okay, now, um, uh, the last slide here in terms of data entry is that we've mentioned that there is a uh, automated EHR solution and there's a uh, online portal. And um, uh, the Academy does understand that documentation and practice is often done on paper uh, at the point of care. Not everybody uses an EHR uh, right now. And um, uh, so you can still participate in IRIS registry um, uh, if you manually enter data into the online portal. Uh, but the caveat here uh, is that the method is much more time consuming uh, than the EHR integration option. Okay, so at this point, um, Dr. Rich, let me turn it back to you here um, to talk a little bit more about how you can participate. Thanks, Mike. How can you participate as a doc? The more data that is collected, the more effective the registry will be. Now, I think this is the most seminal change I've seen in our profession in 37 years. So we urge you to be part of future innovations in ophthalmology and improve patient care. Benefit from the government program and their financial incentives. We'd like to have at least 2,000 participating physicians by 2015 for the data to be very relevant. We anticipate having over 16 million patients in the registry by 2017. Some recent es estimates are up to 20 million patients. The start of big data for our profession. To encourage you, uh, the first 2,000 Academy members to sign up to participate in the registry will able, be able to do so at no cost for two years. Uh, participant 2001 will pay a 500 per year fee. Don't be Dr. 2001, and that actually is the return on investment between $500 and the, uh, and the financial benefits that I referenced earlier is not a bad return on investment. Um, if you want to be part of this, how do you sign up? Send a message to irisregistry at aao.org. Fill out a questionnaire, review the contracts. You'll be placed on a reservation list in order of receipt of the signed contracts and the questionnaire. Practices will be contacted in the order of reservation list to receive the software for installation. Reservations allow the Academy to let users start while maintaining a good user experience for existing users. Um, for more information about the registry in general, um, Ronaldo has put together uh, working with the quality of care in the DC office, some wonderful materials uh, at AAO registry, aao.org backslash registry. And you can send questions and we'll respond by email to irisregistry at aao.org. Uh, visit the Academy Resource Center in New Orleans, group 3239, and there will be several presentations on the registry at the annual meeting. For more information about the interplay between the EHR meaningful use and PQRS, visit the Academy Thelmic Executives. Uh, at www.aao.org slash EHR and come by and come to the Academy's electronic office in New Orleans to see some demonstrations. The Academy will conduct more free webinars and will focus on specific aspects including PQRS and EHR integration. I'd like to sum things up. The Irish Registry represents a seminal change in how we improve our performance and outcomes while shortening the timeline for the dissemination of important clinical knowledge, expanding research opportunities, and facilitating drug and device surveillance. The shortening of timeline is critical. We do better than any other specialty, but if you look at what happens to a NEI randomized clinical trial and 
when aspects of that are adopted into clinical practice, it's 50% at 10 years. With sufficient support, it'll bring us all up to speed. To make this successful, we must continue to have a broad input from the specialists and have a viable business plan done and not adversely affect physician workflow. Done. If you notice, the title of this is IRIS. This is a registry for all ophthalmologists. In summary, if you go back to look at Harvey Feinberg's pressing comments, president of the Institute of Medicine, our keynote address at the 2008 Academy Joint Meeting, quote, we are facing challenging times in healthcare in the United States today. I believe that ophthalmology has an opportunity not only to play a part in the solution to those challenges, but also to be an example for the health professions in the way forward. Frankly, colleagues, this is part of our DNA. The first meaningful randomized clinical trial, Arnold Pat's ROP, juvenile blindness decreased 50% in five years. The gold standard of randomized clinical trials, EDTRS, the best comparative effectiveness trial, the CAT trial. We can go on and on. So innovations like this are part of our illustrious history. Ronaldo? Before we uh, turn it over to Ronaldo, let me quickly remind our audience, if you'd like to send in questions, which many of you have, simply click on the general chat tab below the slides, type your question in the white space below that, and then click on the send button, and that will get your questions in the queue. As mentioned, we do have quite a few questions on the way, and we'll continue now with uh, by turning it over to Ronaldo to let him lead our way through the Q&A. Ronaldo? Great. Thank you very much, Kurt. For uh, Dr. Rich and Dr. Chang, we have a number of questions regarding how do I participate in the IRIS registry. I think you did a good job of uh, explaining to people how the process works, but it might be worth your getting into a little more detail and explaining where we are in the development, the early access program, as well as giving people an indication of when this will be generally available to the entire uh, ophthalmology community. Well, I'll, I'll bounce this back and forth with Mike. We are uh, mapping uh, several EHR systems now. And uh, once an EHR system is mapped into the registry, which takes a couple weeks of, of uh, work on FIG's part, it's really quite easy to bring on the next EHR system. We started with the most commonly used EHR systems. And we, again, the beauty of this software is it's EHR agnostic. Mike, can you uh, give us a rundown on uh, the most popular EHR systems and uh, that we've got uh, under mapping now? Yeah, the I know that FIG, um, the last that I heard about this, FIG had... Um, has been working on, and in fact may have completed integration with um, uh, at least 10 or 15 different um, uh, EHRs. And they've got a lot of experience working with new systems. Now I know that they've definitely mapped um, uh, to at least four or five systems, um, MedFlow, NextGen, um, uh, there's an MD IntelliSys practice there, and there's also an IO uh, practiceware uh, system. Uh, beyond those, I'm not 100% sure what their status is with the others. But well, those are the ones that I know that they've had experience with actually successfully mapping to. For large groups and academic groups, uh, we're in the process of working with um, EPIC at several academic centers, so we hope to have them on board too. Um, there's a couple questions here that I see, Ronaldo. Um, what's the value of IRIS if you don't have a plan or plan to have an EHR? You can submit your quality measures like you could with quintiles. Um, so we have the ability to submit um, um, via registry. Also, you can participate in the surgical modules quite easily. We have a large hospital system in New York. It doesn't, isn't up on EHR, and they're in the process now of just bringing on, on a web-based portal, uh, corneal graft registries and development, the cataract registries. So you, there are different ways of participating, as Michael pointed out. Another question is, does the incentives only apply to Medicare? 
uh, for Medicaid, it will help you with the EHR meaningful use, uh, but the uh, uh, PQRS bonuses are strictly for Medicare, but it will help you as a pediatric ophthalmologist. And uh, Dr. Rich, there were some uh, questions as well related to will the IRIS registry be able to function with cloud-based EHR systems? Uh, I'll let Mike uh, get into that. He's the informatics guy, but we do have, we're in the process now of mapping a cloud-based EHR system. I think it's in Florida, Mike. Yeah, the answer is yes. Um, uh, FIGMD and this strategy does work with cloud-based systems. Obviously, the logistics of mapping with a cloud-based system are a little bit different um, because the practice doesn't own the server, um, but it does work. Now, with regard to which cloud-based systems and um, you know what the stat and you know how they've specifically done that, uh, I would have to get back to you on um, you know where we are with it. And if you could, if you could send. Um, uh, me an email with that, I'll be happy to sort of take that on. So in other words, what your system is, you know, where the data are stored, and uh, we can try to get you some answers on those. But the short answer is that, yes, it does work. It is intended to work with cloud-based systems. Ronaldo, I see another question. Um, how does this differ from quintiles? Quintiles is, is basically just a PQRS uh, reporting registry. Iris lets you do that as a quality improvement uh, modules has the MOC, the ability to work with MOC, so it's a dramatically more robust uh, registry. And I think the uniqueness of this is, again, no one before has been able to look at the impact of interventions, whether they be biologics, surgery, a device or a drug on a natural course of disease. Because other registries were hospital-based, we have found a way to merge interventional data done in an ASC or in the office into a linear registry. That's what makes this uh, very unique. Switching gears a, a bit to talk about participation, there are a number of questions regarding is participation limited to a single practice, or is the objective to sign up multiple physicians within a practice? If uh, you could explain uh, for the participants uh, the dynamics there. Sure. The big advantage, uh, Ronaldo, is getting as many docs in as, as possible. In my group, I have a group of 10. It's going to be nice to actually not only compare ourselves to a national database, but internally. Um, I don't think most groups within a practice have much of an idea of the absolute outcomes of their partners. So uh, if individuals will participate, the more the better, um, the more within a group, that gives you one more reference point that you can compare yourself to. Um, and will data be analyzed according to the site of practice or the type of practice organization? No, this is an individual level. Um, this is for professional improvement on the individual level. An individual physician participate in the group does not? Yes. But again, you lose the wonderful dynamic. One of the positive things about working in a group is interaction with your colleagues in ongoing uh, um, flow of knowledge. Imagine how more robust that would be if, if, if you had an outcomes registry. Thank you, Dr. Rich. Uh, similarly, a uh, question regarding participation. There are a number of questions regarding practices that employ optometrists. And the question is regarding uh, participation by optometrists who are uh, employed essentially by ophthalmologists. Will they be able to participate and how will, would that process work? We don't. We haven't decided that, Ronaldo. Uh, obviously, this will not be open to uh, people outside of an ophthalmic uh, team, uh, and obviously, the optometrist would not be listed in a cataract registry or coronal graft registry. Uh, it would be feasible to 
to measure your optometrist as they related to whatever. But we have not made a policy decision on whether to do that or not, but it will definitely not be open to optometrists outside of an ophthalmic group, and we haven't made a final decision for those inside a group. So we would uh, ask everyone to uh, stay tuned as uh, we work through those details. And again, we will have a number of updates regarding progress that the Academy is making in the development of the IRIS registry leading to an early 2014 actual launch. Again, uh, we are in what we are calling an early access phase in order to be able to make sure that the registry is uh, working very well to ensure a good user experience for everyone. So as Drs. Rich and Chang have explained, there are a number of, of details that remain to be finalized, so we certainly appreciate your uh, patience as we work through those. A question uh, regarding the uh, $500 participation fee that was covered in the call. And the uh, question is, can you clarify for how long people who pay the $500 will have access to the IRIS registry? Uh, our business plan is that as long as you're a participant, you will have access to your ongoing data. Are there other measures besides the one in PQRS and meaningful use? That's a great question. And uh, yes, yeah, so as you know, um, most of the PQRS measures, there's only a couple of outcomes measures there, one for glaucoma, one for cataract. We are developing true outcome measures for grass, macular, wet, new onset of uh, wet AMD. We're going to have true meaningful outcomes measures. So this goes way beyond uh, PQRS and meaningful use. Yeah, Bill, along those lines, um, I, I see a question pop up uh, basically saying um, not all EHR are equal and not all data uh, will be equal, and there may be some bias in terms of the interpretation of outcomes. In other words, um, uh, quote, garbage in, car garbage out. And uh, so the question was, um, you know, what are we planning on doing with that? And um, uh, I think this is one thing that we've discussed really extensively in the measure development work group. And, um, you know, the short answer uh, is that that's a very important issue. And, um, you know, we're aware of it. And, um, you know, trying to design the checkboxes and um, you know, measures in the way to just um, you know make it as legitimate as possible, but there's you know it, it, it's a it's a tough issue. I see another question, Mike. Uh, how about communication with the government and registries? We've had extensive discussion with uh, Patrick Conway, who's uh, head of quality at CMS, and as part of the fiscal cliff legislation, it includes very specific language asking societies what how do you define a meaningful clinical registry that would give you allow you to qualify to, for PQRS the value of the, uh, the reporting in meaningful use to avoid the owner's penalties of a value-based modifier and it's not going to be a simple device registry it's going to have to be a significant clinical registry with uh, methodologies to measure feedback and improvement uh, so some of the simple devices, they will not qualify. Iris will. Here's another there one for you. How has the lightweight connection been tested for impact on the EHR? It doesn't slow it down. It extracts the data uh, offline at night. And we don't, uh, there, we've talked extensively with our colleagues in cardiology and uh, there is no slowdown in the, uh, in the running of your HR system or your server. Yeah, I don't, Bill, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Basically, the lightweight connector is a database. Um, it's basically a small database system along with the software that it takes to configure and sort of extract the data uh, from the EHR. And, um, you know, the experience is that it really hasn't, um, it really hasn't been slowing down. Um, uh, sort of operational work at all. Um, it does require a little space on the server, but um, you know, somewhere between the order of one and two gigabytes of memory 
um, you know, on the surface, so re really not a whole lot. Uh, I do see one question uh, here. Uh, for surgical purposes, are the integration or and or web-based solutions similar to what's been presented here? And uh, uh, the answer to that is um, uh, yes, they are. And for some of the surgical outcome measures, and Bill had alluded to this earlier, um, for some of the surgical outcome measures, uh, the things that are, you know, that we would normally want to collect are not always things that are extractable in EHRs very easily. You know, things like what type of IOL did you put in? Where is it in the bag? You know, is it in the anterior? Um, you know, is it in the capsule or the sulcus or is it sutured? And, um, you know, so, you know, with, in other words, within EHRs, you know, they don't have checkboxes you know, for those items. Uh, and so we have developed some templates, um, you know, for people to enter uh, you know, in, in a really kind of rapid fire uh, way. Uh, for those, and so the reason I mention that is that um, uh, yes, it is similar to what's presented here, but there is a little bit more of a manual component for some of the surgical stuff. One question that uh, uh, has come up here a couple times in the uh, in the chat here: uh, the question is related to are there any additional costs for ophthalmologists or their practice to participate? Beyond the five hundred dollars, the question seemed to be related to installation, IT maintenance, interaction with FigMD to get up and running. Uh, is there a way to quantify uh, any cost beyond the five hundred dollars uh, that was quoted? Uh, that's that's a great question. There are no financial costs, and there's a very detailed description of the experience of the physicians who are already uh, going through the mapping process now. There's, I think it's called an FACQ sheet. It gives you very detailed estimates on staff time. Um, and uh, I see a, a comment from someone in the audience who's just had this done using uh, MedFlow. And basically, they said it was fairly easy. But there are no financial uh, uh, any other financial fees and the, and the maintenance is really done remotely by the software vendor rather than the folks in your office. Thank you very much. There's a question related to participation. Any plans to include colleagues from the VA system and or the Department of Defense? medical center in the IRIS registry? Great questions. Um, not only are we looking to, uh, to talk to the VA, we're looking to harmonize um, things like a cataract and a graft registry with our international colleagues so that we'll be comparing apples and apples and oranges to oranges. Uh, I think there's eight current um, cataract registries in Europe and in India, Malaysia, uh, and we're actually working very carefully with the measure developed with the registry participants in those areas to make sure we're measuring the same thing. We've had some preliminary discussions with our VA and DOD colleagues. It would be nice to have one registry. That is our goal, to have one registry that can meet the ophthalmic needs domestically and globally. A follow-up question. I'll call it a follow-up. It's similar in, in that it's a participation question. Uh, the question is, are residents and residency programs invited to participate? It's very interesting. Um, yeah, we, I, I think that, Mike, I'll let you, since you're an academician, do um, you think there would be broad-based interest in uh, looking at the progress, surgical progress of your first, second, and third year residents, your fellows? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I do, too. I do, up, too. It came up once um, in a discussion, as I remember, with the ABO group, because somebody um, uh, from their team was interested in the same, in the same question. And, um, you know, we haven't, I mean, there's nothing so far that we've done that allows us to analyze data uh, based on that. And I think one of the challenges uh, is that it's not always um, uh, obvious in every system, uh, 
when a resident or fellow was involved um, in care for the patient because, you know, if they don't log into the system or if it's not really documented uh, in the system. And so I think the best answer that I personally could give uh, for that is that it's really interesting and we want to figure out ways to do it, but I don't think we can do that at this minute. I agree. I think one of the, one of the exciting things, and I think Mike uh, can comment on this too, is, is how this is rapidly evolving and the possibilities uh, that we've experienced in the last 18 to 24 months that we've been working on this issue. It is really exciting. Um, and I don't think we know the limitations of the registry of this type. Uh, we're just scratching the surface, but to, we made very clear what our goals are uh, uh, initially. And this is, the, this is not a research vehicle. It can be used for research. The outpatient registry in for uh, ACC, I never thought it would generate the influence of big data, they have over 48 articles in, uh, in publication or pending publication this year alone. So we don't even know the scientific questions that are going to be raised that we'll be able to address, but it's exciting. I have a question from the audience regarding financial incentives and whether these apply uh, only to Medicare and does it extend perhaps to Medicaid? And then as a follow-up of that, uh, the particular uh, person asking this question says that as a pediatric ophthalmologist, will this apply to their practice? Well, I'll take the first piece of that. It, the the value-based modifier and the PQRS penalties apply to Medicare. The meaningful use and the, and the generous uh, meaningful use EHR adoption uh, will benefit um, uh, pediatric ophthalmologist. Mike, why don't you talk about the uh, integration into the subspecialty? Yeah, the, I, I mean, I happen to be a pediatric ophthalmologist also, and um, the the answer is that yes, it'll definitely apply to the practice. Um, several of the outcome measures that we're working on now involve um, pediatric ophthalmology-specific topics, uh, things like uh, amblyopia and strabismus. And um, we've um, actually gotten pretty good collaboration with the APOS uh, group. And in fact, they've been pretty enthusiastic about wanting to take this out to their research committee. Uh, and the reason it's called their research committee is not because this is research per se, but it's because they're the ones who um, apparently within the APOS organization uh, uh, you know, do things like outcome measures. Uh, and so, um, you know, so in principle, there should be more coming up, you know, hopefully through that collaboration. Thank you very much. We have a question related to the value-based modifier. The question really is, what is the value-based modifier and have details about what one has to do to avoid the penalties associated with it been determined at this point? Great question. Uh, as part of the uh, health reform, Congress is mandated, has mandated CMS to pay physicians differentially starting in 2015 on the basis of their value, of their outcomes, their quality outcomes, uh, for now that's defined as PQRS, and the efficiencies of the services they provide. And if you go back to the slide, which will be available probably within a day or two online, you can see that these are actually very significant. In 2015, uh, the emphasis is going to be on large groups and, and specialties that are high impact, like cardiology. But we will, but by law, they must address all physicians by 2017. Uh, there's great material on the website that was put together by um, uh, Ms. Lang in the DC office. It goes into the specifics of how CMS is proposing. Uh, to implement this. But basically, in summary, if you qualify for PQRS, you avoid the penalty. There are some arcane ways of getting some bonuses involved that uh, we can help you with that. But the big thing is that if the onerous bonuses, if you get PQRS, uh, you avoid the value-based modifier. But there's extensive discussions of this on the Academy website. 
And uh, Dr. Rich, related to this, uh, there are a number of questions regarding meaningful use and the uh, various incentives. I know you covered it during your presentation, but it might be good just to uh, reiterate uh, the key points. Well, for now, if you go back to the slide, and again, this will be posted, uh, IRS will let you qualify for your, for your quality reporting for stage two. Also, we, are, we are, have formed coalitions in Washington. If the government put out what are the benefits, how you define a clinical, meaningful clinical registry and what are its benefits. And there is a growing uh, movement in Washington to push for if you participate in a clinical registry, you're going to meet meaningful use. Now, does that mean we're going to have to stop reporting on goofy things? I don't know, but certainly that's our we are taking a broad-based approach to this, not only looking at quality measures and um, what's important for the profession, but we've worked collaboratively with other folks with registries in Washington to broaden the regulatory and financial impact of meaningful registries. Our goal, my goal, whether it's achieved or not, is to not only have IRIS uh, qualify you for the quality reporting, which is quite significant for meaningful use, but also to, to give you a gold star for uh, all the stages. Whether that happens or not remains to be seen. But there is a feeling for some of the people at CMS that they consider this uh, registry far more meaningful than the PQRS reporting and uh, other stages of meaningful news. But, uh, that's our goal. Yeah, Bill, if I can just add one thing to that, which you, uh, you actually said, but to um, uh, just emphasize it, that uh, within stage two of meaningful use, there's a so-called um, menu set with um, uh, where you have to complete uh, three out of six objectives, and um, uh, participating in IRIS registry would satisfy uh, one of those menu set items involving uh, transmission of data to a specialized registry. Right. Thank you, Mike. So, doctors Rich and Chang, we you seem to have uh, answered. Substantially, all the questions here, the only one left is how will ophthalmologists withdraw from the IRIS registry if they find the experience non-rewarding? How will they respond? <laughs> they just um, turn it off. Um, and our goal, we again, I stress this right in the beginning, Ronaldo, is that if this interferes with our day in and day out, function in the office, it will not be successful. So you have physicians uh, on this development group that have really, really, that is utmost in our mind, it has to be meaningful and it has to be easy to use. Um, if it is and there's value in the quality, docs will sign up. There are other questions on here, Ronaldo, and I think that, uh, I think probably what we can do is if we can have, we have several names on here, and perhaps we could uh, uh, find some way of identifying them and getting back with an individual response to the staff if a uh, reference to the website doesn't work. Uh, I'm not sure the logistics of that, but. Yes, uh, what we will do is uh, take a look at any specific questions to e that each individual has, has asked, and, and if we did not specifically address it, we will have the uh, academy staff uh, working with Dr. Rich and Dr. Chang get back to each person individually. Uh, that's probably the, the best way to uh, take that on. We are uh, running up against the end of our time. I, I would like to just ask both Drs. Chang and Dr. Rich for any final comments, thoughts you might might have on the IRIS registry and the benefit that you anticipate it will provide to the ophthalmology community? Well, I'll start. And I've been in practice 37 years, and I've always been proud of our emphasis on education and quality. I'm in private practice. Um, but this is a game changer. Uh, we've waited quite a while for the confluence of technology reward 
and the feasibility to come together. And I, uh, I think this is the most exciting thing that I've seen in my practice, and I wish I had access to it 15, 20 years ago. But it will be used by young stars like Michael. Mike, your comment? Um, Bill, I'm going to just restate what you just said, um, which is that I agree that this is a, a game changer. It's not an easy project um, at all. And um, you know the way that I think about it is that in um, in in the 1980s, when I happened to be in high school, um, you know some of the earliest popular word processing programs were you know you know becoming mainstream, and people were you know typing, and it just you know the benefit is that those programs didn't do a whole lot; they just let you. Um, you know, erase the words that you did without having to use whiteout, you know, which is what we did with typewriters. And um, uh, now it's a different wor world with word processing programs that you can do so much. Um, you know, track changes, check your spelling, check your grammar. And this is something that Bill alluded to earlier, uh, that in a lot of ways we've only scratched the surface of what we can conceptualize uh, with tools like this. And um, I think in a lot of ways um, this project now is building that infrastructure to do those really exciting things in the future that are really going to revolutionize the, um, you know, the profession. Uh, and so I think that that's what makes this such an exciting um, time and such an exciting project to, re to be able to work on. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rich and Dr. Chang, for uh, your leadership on this important Academy initiative. And we want to thank everyone for taking their time to participate in this webinar. There's been a lot of interest in the IRIS registry, as evidenced by there were more than 350 of you on uh, this webinar this evening. A uh, reminder that a recording of today's session will be available later this week. And if you'd like more information about the IRIS registry, please visit www.aao.org slash IRIS registry. And for, uh, to have your questions answered individually, you can send an email to irisregistry at aao.org. And for those of you who will be in New Orleans for the Academy's annual meeting, we strongly encourage you to visit the Academy Resource Center at booth 3239. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Kurt for closing comments. Thank you very much. That does conclude our virtual seminar for today, IRIS Registry, Improving Performance and Outcome in Ophthalmology, sponsored by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and presented by Dr. Michael Chang and Dr. William Rich. Ronaldo Wanzo was your content moderator. We do hope everyone enjoyed the program. Please stay connected. As we conclude the event, you'll be taken to the page just mentioned, and that would be the www.aao.org forward slash IRS Registry. So you'll be taken directly to that page as we end the presentation. Today's program is copyright 2013 by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, all rights reserved. Thank you all for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your day.